I am a uh, Gen X recovering nonprofit executive turned tech entrepreneur. And a few years ago, quit my job as the president of a good sized NGO to lead a tech startup that we had incubated there. And a lot of my friends thought I was either very brave or very foolish uh, to reinvent myself in midlife and as a tech entrepreneur at that. So why did I do it? I don't know about you, but I'm experiencing considerable urgency about the state of the planet. We're surrounded by planet-sized challenges and boundaries from climate change to persistent poverty to strife and civil unrest to homelessness in towns like our own. And um, we're not, this is the only home we've got, right? We're not getting off this planet anytime soon. Some billionaire might uh, put a you know, vegan Mars colony up, right? But I don't want to live there. I'm interested in our home planet. Uh, and I don't believe we're going to get off it anytime soon. Humanity is a long ways away from becoming a multi-planet civilization. And speaking of which, nobody is coming to rescue us. The physicist Enrico Fermi famously asked, where are they? Right? There are billions of planets in the universe that should sustain intelligent life. Surely several civilizations would have figured out intergalactic travel by now, but we don't encounter them. Why is that? There's a prominent theory that holds that before intelligent life leaves its home planet, it runs into a massive obstacle, a great filter of sorts, that essentially becomes an extinction event. And that's why we haven't met them any, uh, yet. So I believe climate change and a whole parcel of other planetary challenges now might be our great filter. And we're the only ones who can do anything about that. So the good news is, humans are incredibly creative. And people all over the world, millions of them, are working on solutions to our wicked problems, these planet-sized problems. Uh, we have an abundance of innovations. We know what to do about climate change, about poverty, about the rest of them. The good news also is that we have the money. We have uh, $200 trillion in the world looking for investments into solutions. So as President Clinton so poignantly puts it, nearly every problem has been solved by somebody somewhere. The challenge of the 21st century is to find out what works and scale it up. So that's our existential crisis, if you will. Can we figure out how to scale up solutions before we fizzle out as a civilization? So what, what's required here is unprecedented coordination and collaboration unprecedented because it's our great filter. It's overcoming climate change and the rest of it. So how do we get to unprecedented collaboration? What's going to require massive, massive behavior change? Well, how do we get to the massive behavior change that makes possible the unprecedented collaboration? Well, a good contender for encouraging behavior change is religion. Right? For millennia, humans have organized around shared beliefs and have undertaken amazing feats uh, in the pursuit of a shared purpose, uh, such as building uh, monumental architecture like the, the Gothic Cathedral in my hometown of Cologne in Germany. Well, that cathedral took 600 years to build. We don't have 600 years to deal with climate change. Right? Also, I would be terrible at creating a new religion. <laughs> Now, we've also seen the power of international collaboration and cooperation. For example, the International Space Station is the largest single investment that we have pooled resources around, $150 billion worth, to send up uh, that amazing piece of infrastructure. Well, to solve things like climate change, we're going to need 10 times those amounts. So again, we're up against speed and volume of behavior change to get to where we need to get with the solutions in time before we fizzle out. And that's where technology comes in. Technology has the ability to accelerate behavior change. And you, I, I'm willing to bet you, you've all participated in some recent technological advances that demonstrate how rapidly we are capable of changing behaviors. I said I'm a Gen Xer. If you had told me when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s that it would be okay to get into cars with strangers, 
And we all do it, right? We look at our devices and we get into cars with strangers. We show up at strangers' houses and spend the night, right? In very short amounts of time, have we evolved our behaviors to expect to have trusted and reliable relationships with perfect strangers. So that's the power of technology to accelerate behavior. Um, now let's think about how that would ap might apply uh, in some of our planet-sized problems. Now climate change is a little bit, of, little bit abstract. Uh, so let's talk about something that we can all relate to. Poop, <laughs> right? Did you go today? Yeah, did you flush? Uh -huh. Did you wash your hands afterwards? Good, glad to hear that. We're incredibly fortunate. That is our reality. One billion people in the world are still defecating in the open. 4.5 billion people don't have reliable access to water and sanitation. And every single day, 1,800 children under the age of five die of completely preventable diseases, waterborne diseases. It's 2018, this is atrocious, right? And we know what to do. I mean, it's, it's sanitation, it's not rocket science, right? We literally know, we solved for this for thousands of years. We know how to, how to do sanitation right. We also have, uh, we know how much it's going to cost. Roughly 1.7 trillion is the estimated price tag for solving water and sanitation for all in the world. And again, we have the money, right? So what do we need? We need an eBay-style eBay marketplace to find all the sanitation solutions that are already working in the world. Right. And then we need a LinkedIn-style way to connect the people looking for sanitation solutions with the people ready to invest in them with the technical experts that can help scale those solutions. It's a gigantic matchmaking exercise. And then thirdly, we need the ability to organize projects around, you know, um, organize them, do some uh, planning around them, aggregate them, perhaps by geography or by sector. We need ways to measure their impact and monitor our progress to the goal of creating sanitation for all. And we need the ability to package new kinds of financial products so that we can funnel billions and trillions of dollars into solving these problems, right? Well, that technology already exists. You know, some of you may have used it. Uh, it's a multi-sided market network is what I'm describing. And you may have used uh, an app called House for your remodeling project in your home. So the same idea, right? It's a marketplace where you can find all the appliances and things. It's a social network where you connect with other homeowners who are remodeling. And it's a workflow management system where you can effectively uh, organize your entire project. So that, in a nutshell, uh, is what we're building. And the technology is very inexpensive to build. All right, so that's uh, a bit of good news, and we're, we're coincidentally prototyping this approach, this framework for uh, essentially building infrastructure that mobilizes solutions and capital at, at the velocity and volume required in the context uh, of water and sanitation. Now, there's a reason <laughs> I'm building this technology, and that is this sort of technology will not be built by Silicon Valley, and it should be obvious why. All right? Technology does what it is designed to do. Right? Facebook, Google, the rest of them, they're not designed around the problem of how we solve these planet-sized challenges. Right? So you all know Facebook, <laughs> you, you're the product. Right? It's designed to sell advertising, similarly with Google. Right? So we, we need different kinds of design principles to build this massive collaboration infrastructure that we envision. So you may have heard of uh, human-centered design, for example, right? Human-centered design these days gets translated uh, such that humans are essentially treated as users or consumers. And technology is designed to distract us, uh, to harvest our eyeballs, right? To feed us clickbait. So we need a different kind of design approach to this collaboration infrastructure. And so we, for example, use um, a whole raft of principles that I'll walk you through in a moment, starting with citizen-centered design. Not human-centered design, citizen-centered design. We're actually treating the individual human uh, with agency and sovereignty over their data and their participation in the identification and creation of solutions. Right? 
this framework needs to be equitable. So everybody who participates in the creation of value participates in any upside, in the recognition, even in the governance of, of the very system we're contemplating. The approach needs to be agile, which is really a fun way of saying you try something, you don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, uh, you listen, you learn, you iterate. It needs to be distributed. The centralization of data creates a whole raft of problems, not the least of which is immense vulnerability. So we're working with a distributed approach, uh, both from a computing and uh, data uh, storage perspective. The technology, this infrastructure needs to be persistent, which is uh, one way of thinking about it is it needs to be accessible from a bunch of different devices and environments, uh, including uh, people who will live in very low bandwidth uh, uh, settings. It needs to be accessible through a number of different experiences, uh, not be predicated on just sort of what we're used to in, in our part of the world. The framework we're building is modular, which is a, a way of, the way I think about it is there's a gigantic box of Legos of existing technologies and apps that already do bits and pieces of what we're talking about when we talk about mobilizing solutions and capital. And so we don't have to go in and build sort of the, the, the app to rule them all. Instead, we're connecting sort of the, all the best pieces, if you will, and just focus on the connective tissue between them. That's also what makes it helps make it scalable, uh, which is uh, one of the requirements, right? That it be that it function uh, in all different settings, that it uh, be able to function in asynchronous uh, ways. So you don't have to be online uh, to be able to interact with it, right? You can have a dumb phone and still be a full participant in this infrastructure. Importantly, th all the pieces that we're connecting up need to be interoperable, right? Data needs to be f f flow freely between the different components of the system through APIs uh, and other techniques. It needs to be measurable. If we're dealing with these planet-sized problems, we want to be able to measure our progress towards solving them. And importantly, it needs to be investable. So we have to find ways and plan to find ways uh, to capture some of the value in financial terms to be able to rope in the necessary capital to help deliver the outcomes. And these are, very imp these are the 10 design principles, if you will, for the technology that may help us survive the 21st century. So here we are on our little blue marble in this vast universe, confronted with our existential challenge, whether or not we will learn to collaborate in time. I believe we have the courage and creativity and indeed the design principles to make that happen. And that is why I'm spending my next 20 years building technology to survive the 21st century. Thank you very much. <laughs>